Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our uh, webinar series. This is the fourth series out of the seven. With uh, today, uh, webinar topic is the comparison between the precast versus non precast building. So, today, uh, as uh, introduced by Dr. Anthony, today we have uh, two speakers. So, Without further ado, let me introduce uh, our first, first speaker for today is uh, Mr. Matty Mikola. He is currently the Chief Operating Officer at Eastern Retech Group Malaysia. And he has a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Tempe University of Applied Science, Master of Business Administration degree from Australian Institute of Business and Bachelor of Law degree with honors from University of London. He has worked in the precast concrete industries in Europe, Southeast Asia, as well as in the Middle East for over 30 years. As the Chief Operating Officer of Eastern Pitech Group, he oversees the operation of a leading precast company, producing concrete components for the infrastructure and building sector in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. So the time for the presentation will be uh, 45 minutes and then will be followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers. So, Mr. Mathematicola, uh, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, yeah, please. And um, let's go into the uh, presentation mode. All right. Um, okay, great. You can see. Good. I will be. I will be trying to compare um, precast concrete construction with conventional. Um, and my, my emphasis will be on uh, cost, which of course is always uh, one of the most important uh, and, and interesting topics for everyone. Um, my, my, my starting slide here is an interesting case. Of course, uh, with the Twin Towers in the back, you know that we're in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the project there in the forefront, which is a, a precast uh, uh, car park, is an interesting case on its own and maybe maybe warrants a, a brief introduction as well. You can see there um, that this building is built with bolted connections. Um, all, all connections, there are no wet connections, all are bolted connections. And uh, the reason for this very peculiar and uh, one, one of a kind uh, design here in Kuala Lumpur was that the building was always intended to be uh, for a shorter time frame. Um, it was only there for less than 10 years. And in fact, by today, it has been already been uh, removed and shifted to another place. So it, it's just one of the things. We, nowadays, we talk about sustainability a lot. Um, precast construction does allow this. You can build a building in a certain location and uh, shift it to another location later on, as long as you use the right connection systems. And uh, it, will, it will become more and more important as we, as we go on um, to be able to ensure that what, how we're building is actually sustainable. First of all, we are normally building for a 100 year time frame, but if we are not, then we need to be able to ensure that the systems can actually uh, still be sustainable. And it, like in this case, the building was uh, dismantled and shifted. Just a brief introduction here on uh, what is, what is uh, Eastern Pre-Tech, the group that um, I'm from. It's part of NSL group, which is a listed group in Singapore. So our headquarters are in Singapore. Um, we run operations in, in four regions, uh, four countries and three regions. We, we consider Malaysia and Singapore as one region. We uh, have a operation in, in UAE, in Dubai called Dubai Precast. And these are the two locations where we're actually 
manufacturing precast concrete and precast concrete is our core business uh, area. And then we have second business core business, which is prefabricated modular bathrooms. And I will not be discussing those today, but it is a, it is an important part of our business in uh, two of the regions, including here in uh, Malaysia. So when it comes to precast concrete, um, Eastern Pretec is a precaster producing components, both for the infrastructure and for the buildings. And uh, my understanding is that uh, this seminar is more concentrated on buildings. So I will only be talking about buildings. In addition to the components here that you see, uh, we do actually manufacture components for tunnels, for bridges, uh, for railways, uh, as well. But uh, today we'll be talking about buildings. Our business is built on, on the left side of your screen, you will see uh, the, the Holocore slabs. We build our business around Holocore slabs. Um, that is our main product. But in addition to that, we produce components um, uh, for the buildings that are required in as well. So, so other, other components include columns, beams, wall panels, solid slabs, double T slabs. There, there are many, there are many, many types of components that are required. So we, we are a, a full stop um, service provider for buildings. Uh, we, we design the buildings, we manufacture the buildings, we, we install the components. And so what, what we are in fact is we are a specialist subcontractor of building structures but we do it using precast. Just a little bit, this is only Malaysia. So our track, track record is, is currently, actually this is slightly old, this slide. So we're now nearing 1,500 projects in Malaysia alone. If you add Singapore and Dubai to the precast buildings, uh, we have, we're nearing 5,000 buildings that we have built um, since the early 80s. Uh, using precast. As you can see there, we are, we are very much concentrated, not so much on residential, but uh, industrial, private, uh, public buildings, schools, hospitals, this is what we mainly do. And residential is a minority. And we'll come to that um, as I go on. Here in Malaysia, we have three um, precast plants in the north, in the central region, and in the south. The south is just bordering Singapore. So the southern factory supplies mainly to Singapore. And we, all of our factories are um, automated with the concrete production, concrete transportation. And as we mentioned earlier, Holocore is our main product. So of course, the Holocore machinery uh, as well with uh, all of its automation. So it's a typical, this is a typical uh, production facility we have both here in, in Malaysia and Singapore region, as well as uh, Dubai as well. So let's start by looking at precast, looking at the precast structural systems then. What, what uh, are the systems that we're talking about? And uh, as I mentioned, costing is the thing that I will be looking at. So buildings. We, we like to build fancy buildings. Uh, the world likes fancy buildings and the technology for building those fancy buildings is everything except modern. Um, precast is one of the, the very few, um, let's say revolutionary technologies, even though that was already you know, 70, 80 years ago when precast first was started in, in a major scale. But most of the buildings still are built the way that photo shows. A lot of manpower, uh, messy sites, and then we like, like, like to build the fancy buildings. We always, of course, think about cars. Why, why, why uh, cars can be built with all these automated factories and uh, buildings generally are not. 
So as I mentioned, um, usually buildings are one of a kind. The particular car you see there, a Toyota car, Toyota produces 7.6 million standardized vehicles. So that's the key point number one. If you wanna do everyone one of a kind, or you can build 7.6 million of exactly the same, obviously you can automate the car production, but it's very difficult to automate the building production. Very, very important is that when you build buildings, those uh, when you are involved in the construction industry, you would know very well. There's dozens of changes along the way. When you build a car and they're set on the manufacturing system for the car, there are no changes except slight tweaks in their efficiencies. But I was recently in a, in a legal uh, seminar related to uh, construction law. And the presenter had uh, only recently become familiar with, with construction as a, a new area. And he was telling us that uh, you guys in construction, you, you guys are totally crazy. I mean, if, if he, he was in fact from a, a autom automobile background. And he said that uh, if, if we compare the building of buildings to the building of cars, it's the same as if a client would come up to you and say, look, okay, I, I want you to build a car. I don't know exactly yet what I want. Um, it will have four wheels. It will have four doors. I might change it to two doors later, but go ahead and start. Um, I need it finished by you know, eight months from now. Yeah. And I'll give you more details as we go along. So he was asking how many people would actually start building the car? No one. But you in construction, you do it every day. And it's true, isn't it? We're building and the architect and the clients are changing every second week, something major. Oh, I don't want this. Uh, I need to change the headroom on this one. I, 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 I need to add another room here. But please go ahead and push, push. So what do we see on the job sites every day is a jackhammer. You can hear the jackhammer sound. When you go to a job site, that's the first sound you hear. The jackhammer is hacking something that has been done. Sometimes it's because it's been done wrong, but very often it's because someone has changed something. So that's the, that's the life that we live with. And so here we are, we need to build in precast something that is going to be changing many times as we go along. So back to my topic of cost. And precast, how does precast handle this kind of, a, of a environment? So these are some of the misconcept, misconceptions about precast. That I, as I've been in marketing for precast for the last 30 years, I run into every time I have a presentation, the client has the same type of thing comes up all the time. Precast is more expensive, I can't use it. Um, that, that, that's what they have, right? That in their mindset is like that. We as Eastern Pretech are not affiliated with any other organization. We are not affiliated to a developer or a contractor. All of those nearly 5,000 projects that we've won, we've only won because we have been competitive. So that's my starting point for today's uh, presentation. How did we become competitive on those particular projects is what I want to explain. Recast is not always more expensive. Yes, I equally admit, often it is. And that's why I will explain where and why. Very often we run to this. Buildings are not waterproof when they're precast. In Europe, you would look at this and laugh immediately. But in Europe, it doesn't rain like it rains in Malaysia and Indonesia and this region. When it rains here, it really rains. And we know that it rains so much that it doesn't even have time to dry off and it will rain again. So the challenges for waterproofing here are significantly higher but there are many, many good details on how to take care of this so that it is not a problem. Where waterproofing has failed 
is very often a situation that manpower has not performed. Workmanship is not up to par. But if workmanship is taken care of properly, precast buildings are waterproof. The third misconception, I just mentioned there are so many changes coming along. We have so many clients that will come and say, I can't, I can't build my building in, in precast because if I decide to change something, I, I can't. Oftentimes this is talking about later on, not during the construction stage, but later on. A, a commercial um, shopping center owner will say, look, this is what I have now. I have a supermarket here, I have these shops here, but later on I need to change. If I build in precast, I can't change. There is flexibility, but just like any proper con contractor, when they make these changes, they need to be connected with the building designer to ensure that the building can be changed as required. Finally, we have built nearly 5,000 buildings and there are so many cases where buildings need to be changed later on. All of the cases have been able to be solved in working together with us as the designers. The final one, someone tells me or someone thinks that they want to go into the precast business because it's suitable for all projects. We in the marketing of precast very often run into a funny situation that the client will pass us a set of drawings and he said he needs to, cut, he needs to build this building and he wants to use precast. And we'll look at it for a couple of days and we'll get back to them and tell them, actually, we shouldn't waste any more time on this one and you shouldn't because this building, the way it's designed is not suitable for precast. And we will admit that from the start because it's no point for everyone to waste their time because with one glance, we can see that the way it's designed, it's not suitable for precast. Why is it not suitable? Because it will be too expensive. It's not competitive. It has not been designed for manufacture and assembly from the start. DFMA is a term we'll come back to later in the presentation, designed for manufacturing and assembly. So what is the cost of construction? This is from uh, Arcadis. They have looked at the, the cost of construction worldwide. I only took half of the graph. So um, the median here is Amsterdam at 100. Um, yeah, as you can see, actually, from the bottom, with the exception of India, Malaysia is the cheapest. Jakarta is very close, uh, Indonesia. Um, and then you have even some European countries which are cheaper than Singapore. So if you look at this region just very close by to us, Manila is there also somewhere halfway, uh, about a third of the way up. So this region generally is one of the cheapest areas for construction in the whole world. That is the environment that we work in. From the start, I will say that the cheaper the labor is, the less competitive precast is as a starting point. The more expensive labor is, the more competitive precast is. So my, my presentation today, because I've been here now for 27 years, my presentation today will be purely based on this region. This region where a typical worker is paid roughly 250 to 300 US dollars per month, if he's a, a general worker. And then above that, maybe 400 if he's skilled or 500 at best. I am not talking about Europe where it's 10 times that or 15 times that. So this is the environment where we are in and this is the cost that I will be looking at. So I've taken, um, I've, I've used the Singapore cost because Singapore, the, the good thing about Singapore is that there is a lot of, um, information available, uh, very good statistics available from the government departments. This particular information is from the BCA in Singapore, uh, which, which provides the construction cost in Singapore dollars per square meter of floor area. 
Singapore dollars being, um, well, you'll, you'll have to convert to your own currency. I'm sure you might know what the conversion is. Approximately 1.35 Singapore dollars to the US dollar. Or one is to three to the Malaysian ringgit. So this is the range uh, where we are for construction. Housing is at, is at the top end normally, of course, depends on, uh, on the height of the buildings. Uh, offices, commercial centers of roughly in that region, multi-story car parks, single-story industrial buildings are always the cheapest um, in terms of final floor area. And then probably the most expensive is clean room fabs, which are these clean room electronic factories building semiconductors. So where, where is uh, precast competitive now? Um, we need to look at the superstructure cost in terms of the total budget. So at, at the least is luxury high rise. The superstructure cost and, and these are very broad because it always depends on what is your ground condition, what are your final finishes, many things, too many, too many variants. So take these with a pinch of salt. These are still estimates. So precast on a luxury high rise is about 20, 25% maximum of the total budget. Probably closer to 20, could be even 15. If really high end where you're talking about everything is marble and whatnot, glass. The, the largest portion, um, again, is in the multi-story car parks, where it could even be up to 50% of the total budget is in the superstructure, because there's very little finishes. After the structure is finished, the building is pretty much finished. You put in your lights, put in your firefighting, it's done. Um, then you, you look at some of these very heavy warehouses, um, clean room fabs, also, the, the percentage can actually be quite high, probably about roughly 30%. So based on our experience of nearly 5,000 projects, where are we most competitive? At first glance, multi-story car parks. Those of you who have had any experience in the US, you would also know very well that most or many of the, of the car parks, multi-story car parks in the US are done using precast. It is the easiest one where or you can say that generally precast is competitive. The next area probably is in these heavy loading warehouses. Um, the loading on, on the floors, typically two tons or 20 kPa uh, and above even. Uh, precast very often is, is immediately um, a competitive. Now these two, these two building types are, are normally also very rectangular, very regular. So that's another thing that plays in for the benefit of precast. Shopping centers, we've done a lot, a lot of shopping centers. Um, architecture is typically already more difficult, but still uh, precast is very often uh, very, very competitive. And finally, we look at residential. And residential, definitely, precast is only competitive if there's a lot of repetition. If there are many identical blocks, precast comes into the picture. So we look at precast feasibility. We're now, we're now having one of these aforementioned projects, and we need to look at is precast actually going to be feasible to use on this particular project? So the first one is structural considerations. We have to look at things like building height, how many floors do we have, and leads to repetition. Number of floors, if it's very high, in the lower floor, in, in, in uh, less high buildings, we can use full uh, load bearing walls. Um, in the very high buildings, we have to use skeletal frames. We have may, may use, choose to use hybrid, uh, which I'll explain later. Um, we have to look at the span. Is the span of the building from, from beam to beam, column to column, is it, is it too long? Is it too short? That will affect it. 
We have to look at fire rating. Is it four hours? Is it two hours? Is it one and a half hours? All of this affects the, the use of precast. Headroom. A precast building typically has beams. So there are headroom issues. Maybe you cannot allow any beams. So you have to go for flat slab. So these are the structural considerations in terms of looking at precast feasibility. Then we look at construction related issues. Speed versus cost, speed. This is always the key point in, in talking about precast. Precast, you achieve speed. Are the costs related to speed justifiable? I would say very much. I, I've taken a few trips to, to India um, to look at, look at uh, partnering into India on precast and so on. And uh, now I have to say this was about four or five years ago when I did it last. So things might have changed. Let's not, let's not uh, forget that. But when the general conception is that a, a residential project construction can take three years to five years, I would very easily pull out and say that is not where we will be with precast. If that is the mindset that it's okay for a project to take five years, then it's no point to use precast. Logistics. Okay, let's talk about speed again. There are projects where speed is of utmost importance. So we talk about all these electronics uh, factories, we talk about data centers, we talk even about car parks. You have a car park building, you have an empty lot that is now being used as an open car park. The owner wants to convert it to a multi-story car park. It's urgent for him to get this thing done so that he can bring the cars back and bring back the business. It was urgent to get it done quickly. Speed is, a, speed is an important issue and therefore it justifies the use of precast. Logistics, we need to look at logistics. Is there a possibility of bringing in big components? Is it so congested that we can't bring them in? Is there, is there limitations on when the, the trailers can go in? What time of day they can come in? What time can we install for 24 hours a day or there's residences nearby? whereby we can only work for eight hours. All these kinds of things we need to look at. Manpower, very important looking at precast. Right now, because of COVID, everyone is trying to find ways of building with less manpower. There's more manpower, the more risk of COVID. So we can reduce the manpower on site. That's where, that's where precast comes in. And I'll show you some uh, projects later on and tell you about the manpower differences. Safety. If you have a thousand people on site or you have 200, it makes a huge difference in terms of safety. And safety is a higher concern now than it ever has been. Massive change even in, in uh, this region in the last 10 years, where it seemed that no one cared. And now a lot of emphasis is being put on safety. Financial feasibility. These are the things that affect it. Standardization, as I mentioned earlier. We need to get repetition, and I'll tell you why a little bit later on. Sometimes hybrid systems are the best choice. We don't even try to push everything into precast. We use a combination. It could be steel and precast. It could be cast in situ and precast. It could be many things to get the, the best, uh, cheapest option for building. You look at the cost savings. The direct cost savings are always easier to, easy to check, but your indirect cost savings are the ones that are most difficult to identify. But with my experience is we often measure ourselves. We met as our most important KPI, key performance indicator is return customers. And when we see that a customer that, we, that has actually for the first time tried out us and precast, and they come back with the next project, means that they have noted that there is a saving in their indirect costs. And it's a very important thing for the con contractor when he looks at his budget afterwards, how did he perform according to budget? And a very important thing, which is cash. So let's look at a few of these items next then. 
Um, this is uh, this is from our partner in Taiwan. I, I spent a few years in Taiwan as well. Um, Rentex Construction is is a meaning meaningfully uh, quite a significant developer in Taiwan. They have used all of these different uh, structural systems. So starting from the left, SRC, what they call is a steel reinforced concrete. That means connections of precast components done with steel or steel structures cast or steel structures um, installed first. And then for fireproofing purposes, they're also then coated with concrete. So SRC. RC is a is just a uh, conventional cast in situ. Steel, um, fully steel structures, very, very popular in Taiwan. And precast is the last one. So a typical type of building where they have done comparisons for a 12 story building and the construction time. So you see 12 stories precast 10 days per floor. That's yes, very common for us to consider that we build a structure in 10 days per floor. So this is, they, they are a developer. So for them, time is money. The faster they can get the building up, the faster they can get income and they can sell it. So they have now been uh, using precast for uh, 20 years and uh, are very, very well versed. And again, I would say not always will they choose precast they may choose any of the other types. For Malaysia, we have a particular uh, peculiarity here is that we have protectionist policies for steel. And so we do not need to compete with steel here very much at all because they get slapped with very high um, import duties. So we typically here will be competing mainly with conventional uh, Cast and two systems. Cash. This is from a developer perspective and from a contractor perspective as well. It, it goes for both. When you build with a conventional system, you follow the S curve in terms of cash drawdown. You are you're starting work early, but the progress actually is over time is quite slow but you're drawing down the cash very early because your structure starts faster, but then progresses slower. So when you use, you have a lead time for planning and then a very quick implementation time. And that's where you start. You only start to draw down your cash much later. So this is a significant benefit for both the developer and contractor, as I mentioned. Very, very significant. So where is the difference then between precast concrete and conventional? This is, I think, a key slide for today. Again, because there are so many variables in construction, I, I, I trust you can take these as guidance only. Is, all, is precast always uh, more expensive? No, it isn't. Is it always cheaper? No, it isn't. So as you see there at the bottom, it could be 5% cheaper. It could even be more than that. It could be as much as 15% more expensive. Specifically looking at the superstructure cost for a building. So let's just go quickly run through the list here. Raw materials account for 40% of our cost typically. Uh, the cost is the same as conventional, except if we are able to use pre-stressed products, which means that we actually can make the uh, structure lighter and we can use pre-stressing. A very good example of that is Holocore. Holocore is by far the most competitive horizontal structure for a building. Then you're talking about minus 15. It is a lighter, it is a lighter structure very often. We look at labor um, fabrication of the components or strictly comparing to a conventional cast institute structure. We are cheaper because there's higher efficiencies in the factory. That's the whole point of running a factory. 
tire efficiencies, your people are under a watchful eye. They're not somewhere inside your building. Your supervisor mainly sees them in the morning. After that, he has no idea what they're doing. So higher efficiencies, we save there. Then we come to malls and foam work. This is where the differences start to, start to add up. We, in, in uh, using foam work for precast structures, we're using proper steel or, or proper timber foam work. In this region, generally steel. And you compare that to the, uh, the rickety uh, timber formwork used on sites. Yes, the formwork is better. But the reason we use it is to get better quality. So there is, there is a difference there. However, that difference can be reduced by repetition. So the moment you've got enough typical floors, your mold cost is diluted so much that you can't even notice it anymore. So that's where repetition plays a very important part. Connections. The connections of precast need to be designed in advance. Whereas in a, in an in, in a conventional building, you have got all your lapping bars and so on. The connections are more expensive than in the conventional structure. The next point is depreciation of investment. Yes, we have invested in a factory. The factory has to be, that investment has to be depreciated. So there is an additional cost there. We have factory overheads. When we are a specialist subcontractor, we include all of the design costs as well. When you hire a conventional contractor, he brings in a team of workers and no one is designing anything. They're following, following drawings. So in fact, the consultant is transferring some of his work to us. We don't charge for it separately. The consultant and the contractor and the developer should actually be saving when they use precast. Okay, the factory produces the components. They have to be transported to site. So that cost is additional to, trans to, to a conventional system. Cranes, similarly, you might need to use bigger cranes than you would in your construction site. So these are the reasons why precast concrete may be more expensive and may not be. So as I said, there are so many variables, I cannot give a clear uh, recipe to say which is going to be expensive, which is not going to be. So in order to look at this, let's look at how we normally de decide on how to design a precast building. The first system type is what we call load bearing walls, which we use on any buildings less than 10 floors high. Typically residential, could be low rise hotels, could be mixed use. That's where we use load bearing wall systems. Structural floor, floor structural frame systems, sorry, are used for typically for commercial buildings, office buildings, industrial buildings, car parks all are structural frame system. Open areas, very, very few walls. Uh, that's where we use structural frame systems. And then hybrid systems, um, combination of precast with other systems. We would use them always when the building is more than 10 floors. We do not use load bearing walls because the load bearing walls at the bottom of the building become so thick and so heavy in order to carry the self-weight of the building. So a self-defeating actually to use a load bearing wall. So let's look at the first one there, high volume, high repetition. Load bearing wall systems, and typically they're used on residential projects. So this is what it looks like theoretically. Um, load bearing walls, carry the slabs, carry the weight for the next floor going up. Um, includes staircases, landings. There are a few beams here and there where you need to use, need to have open areas. You put in precast beams connected to the uh, load bearing walls. Each floor is very typical. So as I mentioned, the steel homework cost is diluted because all the floors are typical. So a lot of these kind of projects have been done. Typically and uh, historically, a lot of these 
connections are what we call wet connections. So it's lapping of bars, uh, U bars with, uh, as you see here, this is a wet connection of the panel to panel. There's been a lot of advancements in this, in this uh, area in the last few years. And uh, these are proprietary connection systems for, for uh, precast walls. And all of these have been designed in mind or, or bearing in mind the, the problems on the site in terms of installing these panels and making it as swift as possible. So uh, these are all uh, readily available and getting more and more popular here in uh, Southeast Asia as well. One example of what we've done, uh, we did seven blocks. Um, not, not exactly identical, but the, the paneling and the precast uh, components were standardized as much as possible. Um, these, are, these are photos before the buildings were painted. But this is typically what it is all about. Um, all the floors are identical, so there's repetition. This is from Abu Dhabi, a very, very large um, dormitory project, 28 buildings, uh, G plus three. Why is G plus three? Is G plus three because the building regulations state that any building that is higher than G plus three requires to have lifts. So obviously for a dormitory building, the lift cost is very high. So those were not, um, those were not installed and the buildings were actually designed as G plus three up to G plus three, some of them only G plus two. Very large volume, very high repetition, all load bearing systems. Well, sorry, load bearing wall systems. Okay, those are the ones with high repetition. So what do we do with the, uh, with buildings that don't have repetition? How can we still be competitive? The starting to this is always modeling, it means always. CAD assisted design. Otherwise, you will have too many problems, too many mistakes. Nowadays, you can already get very, very fancy building information modeling. We, we have uh, actually implemented Tecla ever since 2007 on trial basis and have been one of the de development partners here in the uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, full scale, we adopted about three years ago. Nowadays, we do all of our projects 100% on BIM 3D. And as you can see there, all of the connections between all of the components, all of the connection items are already fully uh, modeled in to the plan. What does that do to us? It, it guarantees that we don't have mistakes in terms of drawings because everything is already modeled into the model. So this is an example, this is a car park for Putrajaya, which is the district, which is the Malaysian capital. Um, just a very simple car park building, which we have done in uh, Bim. And the whole point here is everything that is on the, on the components is modeled in here as well. So every single connection is already there. So, so how does the column, how does the, the holo core connect to the beam? How does the beam connect to the column? What are the connections between the column and the beam, which is always very congested and all of the rebar as well. And then we can even model and simulate, simulate the uh, construction process. The gray being in situ portions and the greens being the precast portions. And how does that then look? So that building just now on the model is the one in the top right hand corner. And the, the larger block here in the center not sure if you can see my mouse, but the larger block here in the center is actually the hospital block itself, which was also fully precast. But the model I showed you was this car park building here. So we model everything on, uh, on BIM 3D and why? This is a typical connection of a column and beam joint. So you have bars coming out from the bottom of the beam, both sides. You have bars going through the connection from the column below to the top. You have all your links so congested that unless it's done on BIM, you will definitely have problems on site. So all of these connections are fully modeled 100% on the system. So the components in a typical structure, columns, beams, 
You can have cantilever slabs, you can have holocaust slabs, you can have solid slabs. Everything is modeled on the system already, looking something like this. I'll show you a few examples of that as we go along. Again, connection systems nowadays available. On the right side, you can see some of these beam, beam to column connections and column to column connections. We use them very widely nowadays uh, and have used for years already. Um, they're slightly expensive, you feel in the beginning, but uh, once you get the hang of it and you start to notice how much faster it is on site, um, it, it definitely makes sense to use these systems as well. You see here a, a project in Abu Dhabi with uh, column shoes. The column height is 28 meters, mast column. You notice there are no props whatsoever. So after the, the column is, is uh, installed upright and the column shoes here on the right are connected, it does not need any um, props. If you can convince your client and his safety manager, but it does not by calculation and in Europe, it is never done. I have to say that here it's very difficult to, to convince client safety managers and they will require us to put in props, but actually it's a waste of money. We have done a lot of electronic factories. Um, these are the so-called clean room factories. They, they typically consist of, of uh, double T slabs, hollow core slabs, and even so-called waffle slabs. Um, there are a lot of vibration specifications, heavy loading. So you can see that the size of the component um, is very big. So, so the worker there is actually very small compared to the components. Very typically 800 by 800 millimeter columns or even a one meter by one meter and even more than that. Very heavy structures. Extremely, extremely fast uh, construction. Uh, is required, and therefore the connections have to be done well. As I mentioned, we've done a lot of car parks. Um, this one is from Dubai. This is a Dubai Metro car park. We've done all the Dubai, the, the Metro car parks, park and ride car parks are very big, 110,000 square meters of, of floor area, fully precast everything. That means these stair walls, uh, core walls, everything in the whole building is precast. Um, construction time for this particular project was about six and a half months, 110,000 square meters, six massive uh, tower cranes working 24 seven. 16 meter span for hollow core, fantastic. Um, if, if you've got a 16 meter span for your uh, car park building, number one, it, it works very well, as I will share, you later, uh, share with you later. Uh, but it is extremely good for precast. Precast is very, very competitive. Data centers propping up everywhere in the world now. We've done plenty of them as well, whether it's, it's in this region or in the other regions. Um, this is what we, we call a cruciform connection. Just wanted to show you that. There are so many bars, vertical bars, and so many horizontal bars. So in order to make that connection simpler, we have taken the connection of the beams outside of the, of the column. And therefore we only have the vertical connection to be done on site. And the horizontal connection is actually done by a half joint outside of the column connection. So when you simply cannot fit your bars into this connection, this cruciform connection is actually one um, recommended. Used a lot in Japan, by the way. Again, these, these buildings need to go up fast. Speed is of utmost importance. This is a building of G plus six, 50,000 square meters. I wanna look at the IKEA. We've done all of the IKEAs in, in uh, Malaysia, four of them. And uh, just some of the challenges to go with, just to go through with you. I'm running a little bit over my time. I'm, I have a few more slides and uh, then we, I'll take questions. This is the first one we've done back in uh, late 90s. Uh, early 2000 with uh, IKEA in uh, Damansara near KL. 16 meter span for Holoko, beams spanning this way, eight by 16. Beams are spanning eight meters, they're pre-stressed. And Holoko then, you can see one Holoko slab here behind the crawler crane, which is a 16 meter Holoko. This is a very typical 
um, layout for IKEA. Why? We spoke to the IKEA main uh, Swedish architect, and he says that because they know that women are the main clients for all IKEAs around the world, it is important to, to manufacture or, or build a building so that they're comfortable for ladies to drive in. They will not notice it, but when they leave IKEA, they will feel that, that the car park was very comfortable for them. It wasn't jammed. There weren't columns everywhere. It's a very large open space. They feel comfortable to come, they will come again. The very principle of IKEA to build their buildings is a very open car park. And if you go next time to any IKEA, you'll notice the same. This was the first one we did, so 20 years ago. The second IKEA job we did, typically they're always about 100,000 square meters. Uh, typically less than six months construction. The next one we did was actually partially a basement. So it brought its own uh, difficulties. Headroom issues in this particular building required us to change the layout around. Instead of having an eight meter beam and a 16 meter Holocaust lab, we put in a 16 meter beam, as you can see on the right bottom, and an eight meter Holocaust lab. With a 16 meter beam, you can't run your services through unless you provide openings in the beam, as you can see here. So we provided openings in the beam to be able to run your firefighting and your, your ducts through the beams and maintain your headroom. So again, same thing, we're working two floors underground and then the rest of the building is above ground. So what you see here is this level here is actually ground level. Same thing, six months. The third one is in the very south part of Malaysia in Johor, the border of Singapore. We are back to the original idea. We run eight meter beams and 16 meter holocaust. So right here, you can see on a trailer, 16 meter holocaust slabs coming in. In the car parks, they are 400 millimeters thick and in the warehouse areas, they're 500. And I'll look at some of those challenges on the next one. This is the fourth one we did just recently in Penang, north of Malaysia. This is where you can see a little bit of the scale of a building and how clean and how neat it is. This is a precast building compared to your custom city buildings. This building, by the time this, this photo was taken, we were about approximately four months into the construction. We had the final stages here to do, as it mentions here, 5.5 months. Um, 70,000 square meters of, of built up area in this building. Um, we have, Certain areas on the warehouses where the loading is as heavy as two tons, uh, 20 kPa. So on those, those areas, we actually used single T slabs rather than hollow core. So all the balance of the floor areas were using hollow core slabs. And then a steel structure to cover it, uh, steel roofing and steel cladding. So some of the challenges we had here, on IKEA jobs, they never do any finishes. On the, on, the, on the concrete. The concrete we deliver is the concrete that finally shows. As you can see here, this is straight from the factory. It looks like this, looks like this, looks like this. No painting. For sustainability, sustainability reasons, they avoid painting as much as possible. Because you have to go back every five years, paint again, they don't want that. Once and for all, it's, it's done when it's precast. So the, the finishes need to be very good on the precast. Very, very wide areas for driveways with very high headroom requirement. So how do you do that? We had to put in some very shallow beams, precast beams. And then of course, interfaces between the, uh, the cast and situ, the conventional areas and the precast as well. So many challenges on this um, as there are. These are just some of the photos from the site, as you can see here. Double. Double T slabs, single T slabs for the warehouse areas, and typically otherwise uh, Holocaust slabs, as can be seen here. But here on the right, you can also see sometimes we have to actually put in a 16 meter beam, which is a heavy pre stress beam. Some of these beams weighing up to 30 tons in order to carry the loads um, coming to the beams. So we handle the, the uh, design for the whole building. And uh, we manufactured and we 
deliver to site and we installed as well, all part of our package. This, this one also took uh, less than six months to install. A quick look at long span products. I was talking about 16. We're comfortable doing 16, even 18 meter hollow core, but beyond that, we have to find other solutions. So as I just mentioned, single T slabs, we've done up to 24, 26 meters very commonly. You go beyond 24, 26 meters, you're probably looking at uh, an I-beam with either a hollow core, short hollow core slab, or, or a, could be a solid slab as well, filigrant slab. And uh, then you have your uh, athletic sta um, stadiums, for example, where you have pre-stressed uh, beams, seating beams, and uh, steps. In this case, we actually used hollow core for the steps. Again, always depends on what is the distance from raker beam to raker beam. Uh, what what component would we actually use? Sometimes we we manufacture tailor make um, seating pre stress seating components as well. I want to quickly look at hybrid systems for high rise, just to give you an idea. When when the building gets very high, typically what we do is this dark gray area outside is precast and the core wall system in the center, conventional. That is to ensure that we have all the lateral stability we need for the building, but then a majority of the floor area is precast. So an example of that here in uh, Malaysia, center core, cast in situ, and the rest of it precast. Center core just for stability reasons. EBS China Square in uh, Singapore, an exception to that rule, everything is precast. You can see here that even the core walls are precast. So never say never. It can also be done in fully precast. So very typically precast in the external, cast in situ in the center for the core walls. And that's the best for high rise buildings above 10 floors. Again, gives you a lot of speed. This one goes up, the sliding foam work and the, the precast follows one or two floors behind. A very easy on a, on a floor of this size to install the precast, it takes a week, no more than a week. So a week per floor to go up on high rise, not an issue. Extreme engineering for you. I mentioned our, our, our partner in Taiwan, Rentex Construction. Blue Ocean Project is a 38 story housing building in, in very fierce seismic conditions. As you know, Taiwan is one of the toughest. Again, this is a precast building, believe it or not. 38 stories. Center core of the building is cast in situ. Everything else is precast. Everything else outside here is precast. So curvature of the building outside here, also precast. Because there's repetition, it can be done. This panel here you see, actually a precast panel. So all of these cantilever panels for architectural purposes and these, uh, these uh, balconies, actually all precast, tied to the building structure. So nothing is impossible when there's enough repetition. So here you can see all of these cantilever slabs with very nice architectural finishes. Almost looks like a granite slab, but is actually precast sandblasted. Connections, seismic areas, splice sleeve connection is the most common for our floor columns. Um, we use them a lot nowadays here also in Malaysia and Singapore. So very short starter bars, the grouted splice sleeve. I'm sure you're calm, you, you might've heard of these or might've used them yourself. Uh, becoming more and more popular as these systems are getting cheaper. Definitely um, worth looking at for any of your high rise buildings. Let's have a quick look at architectural planning. This is the, this is the nicer side of precast. This is the one that always used for marketing. Um, these are architectural panels with uh, with a retarder surface, that means the surface of the panel is washed and to expose the, the nice colored limestone colored aggregates. This is a New York University in Abu Dhabi where these are white panels with uh, sandblasted surfaces. All of these panels in between the windows also precast. And finally one which is uh, very complicated looking, all that you see, these are not GRC panels, these are actually full concrete precast panels 
with different colors of precast concrete done by us. This one is in Dubai. This one also is, I remember correctly, is a 24, 25 story hotel, a Marriott hotel in Dubai. One of our nicest references. So coming to the end of my presentation, what are the benefits then of using precast? The list you've probably seen already before. Savings on indirect costs on site, as I mentioned, less overhead. Faster construction process, if that is important, it makes us competitive. Higher quality product goes without saying, definitely. You're producing in a factory environment, better supervision, better quality control, higher quality product. Less wastage, a lot less wastage. If we're building a big project like one of the EKS, we do not need to have someone come in and take a dumpster full of trash out every day. There's hardly any trash that we produce on the site. Almost everything is dry connections and there's no trash, no waste anywhere on the site. Less labor on site, as I said. We look at a typical EKL project. The, the contractor, the Japanese contractor, had told us that if they would need to build this project through superstructure in the five and a half months that we used, they would have needed more than a thousand workers on site. At best on site, we had 120. So that's a saving of 900 workers for a time period of six months. A massive saving on skilled labor on site, all the problems related to labor, um, they, are, they are actually shifted to us. We don't have that many workers either. So a significant reduction on uh, manpower and labor. So that, in a nutshell, is, uh, is where we are. Um, I guess we can go on to, to your questions. I, I will leave my presentation up just in case I need to scroll back to any of my slides so that uh, I'm... I'm um, thank you, that's, that's my presentation. So I'll hand over back to Jimmy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matthew McCullough, for your presentation. Um, now we are uh, beginning the question and answer session. For those of you who want to ask your questions directly to Mr. Matty, you can raise your hand and, and I call your name. You can unmute your microphone and ask your questions. And for those of you who are prefer to write down your question in chat box, you can also write down your question. Or even in Bahasa, I will try to translate uh, for Mr. Matty. Is there any question from the audience who wants to ask directly? Okay, while well, we are waiting, there are some questions in the chat box. Uh, one, uh, first one is from Mr. Henry. Questions in Bahasa, I will try to translate. The question is how effective the usage of the precast concrete for uh, two-story houses. This is the, the, he's asking about the uh, typical residential houses, let's say in terms of numbers and the type. Okay, um, in, in my earlier slide, I had terrace houses as um, one of the points. Uh, we we would say that. Um, for any so-called terrace houses, link houses, whatever they might be called, typical residential two-story landed property. Um, the, the transportation and the logistics cost and the cranage cost are significant. So the way that uh, one can try to reduce the impact of those is to actually manufacture the components nearer or on the site. That means you save on your logistics cost. Your cranage cost is still the same. Um, when it comes to the floor slabs, uh, the issue is not so much because you can actually transport a lot of floor slabs in one load. But when it comes to transporting wall panels, you typically can only transport, let's say, four or eight panels at a time. So the transportation cost is very high. So certainly it can be done. Um, if you were to ask, us to do a, a large a residential two-story building uh, terrace house type of complex, even we would actually set up a side casting yard for the wall panels. And we would do the beams and the uh, holocaust labs in the factory. 
depending, of course, how, how far the site is from our factory. But that would be a general guideline. Again, all depends on the number of components to produce and the repetition. If that's under control and the building, the project is big enough, there's no, there's no reason why precast would not be competitive. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matthew, for the answer. The second question is from Christopher Jussi. His, uh, his question is, do you have any suggestion on how to optimize logistic costs when you use small amounts of precast concrete? This is, I think you already answered. You can build the uh, plastic, uh, the elements at the site, but maybe if you have any other uh, suggestions for optimizing yeah. the logistics if the small amount of precast concrete is used. Yeah. One very important point that uh, we, we consider in the design stage is the transportation. So you always have to consider what is the shape of the panel or the shape of the component and what are the dimensions. As we all know, a typical truck, a typical trailer is 2.4 meters wide. And you, if you go wider than that, depending on the regulations, you can even go up to three, 3.5 meters, but then you need to bring in different type of equipment and you might even need to bring in escort services. So police escort. So you don't want to do that. So the, the key thing is design your product so that the weight is okay to transport on a typical trailer, the width is okay to transport and that is stackable. That means you can put several of them and maximize the weight that is allowed to be transported. And that's the way to cut down on the transportation costs. Okay, thank you for the answers. Uh, third question is from Mr. Ari Pibowa. The question is, would you please elaborate more on precast core walls? Okay. Um, pre precast core walls, uh, at, at at their optimum is precast core walls are already considered to be precast in the early design stage. However, I will admit that is very often is not the case. Very often we are given a set of architectural drawings and the core walls are already there. And we need to design the core walls to, to suit to the, uh, the architectural layout. So if I scroll back up, are you still seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll scroll back up just to have a look at the at, at typical core wall type of a building here. So as I said, if we're if we're looking at, at a precast core wall. Precast core walls, as you can see even here, is that the precast walls are actually split into typically 2.4 width panels, 2.4 meters width, if possible, because they're very heavy. A core wall typically is, has a thickness of 150 minimum, and typically 200, even 250 in high rise buildings. So they're very heavy. So we prefer to transport them flat. Uh, all the big panels that you see here in the facade panels and so on, they're actually transported typically on A-frames. That means they're transported vertically, but the core walls are transported flat. So we make them 2.4. So a major cost on the, on, the, on the core walls is the fact that you have to design all of the connections between all of these walls, which is an additional cost compared to in situ. So oftentimes that's one of the reasons when we get to very thick core walls, um, they, if let's say for example, for a very high building, the core wall is 300 millimeters thick. And we, we want to break it down to smaller panels so that it can be lifted by the crane on site. It becomes so small that, it, that there are just too many connections. So that's why I'm saying that in many cases, we actually prefer that the client casts the core wall in situ using a climbing form or slip form system. The one project that I showed you where we had used uh, precast core walls, we actually used a, 
a, a double wall type of a, a cavity wall system where we had the external two surfaces and an empty uh, cavity in between that was cast on site. That is one way of doing core walls as well, but not very commonly used around here. So it's really a question of if you can lift it, your crane is big enough, then you can use precast walls. They're very heavy. If you can't lift it, then convert it to cast in situ and use, use the automated systems like climbing foam or slip foam. And uh, there will be no impact on your schedule. They can be just as fast as precast when it's just a very simple slip foam system. I hope that answers your question. I'm, I'm not, if you want me to elaborate, uh, please, please ask me. I think it's um, okay. So we are moving to the next questions. These two questions uh, are related to the connections. So the first one is, what is your technical advice of the use of precast component for the seismic area? I mean, in the tactility, medium tactility class, in terms uh, of the maybe usage of rigid or pin connection for the beam and column. And the second one is asking about the, in the, your slide, one of your slides is showing the usage of the emulative cast in place uh, joint system. You're asking whether this is uh, as compared to the conventional, if there is uh, more usage in the steel bars, and if compared to the mechanical condition, what is the cost? Is this more expensive or cheap, cheaper? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, connections for seismic areas. Uh, Malaysia has got very low seismic design requirements. So we're lucky in that way, it's Singapore as well. I know that Indonesia is different than certain areas and uh, Southern China, Taiwan. Uh, Philippines. So each region has its own challenges. The, the most well-versed in terms of designing seismic structures in this region are the Japanese and the Taiwanese. And of course, it was originally the Japanese and they taught the Taiwanese. And now the Taiwanese actually are, are equally good at what, what they're doing. And as I mentioned, um, the, the other part of your question was that uh, whether we should use pins or we should use rigid connections and so on. This is a very specialist type of, of uh, question and, and again, depends very much on the building itself. According to my experience, what, what the Japanese are, are recommending nowadays, um, and in fact, on some of the high-rise buildings and most of the high-rise buildings nowadays, they put in their huge um, damper pads below the structures, below the foundations to absorb the movement, which helps a lot. But then in terms of the connections of the, of the columns and the beams, my understanding always is that the column is, is designed to be rigid and the beam is designed to be weak. That means in a situation where there's, there's a, heavy seismic movement, the column uh, remains intact and the beam is the, the uh, component that actually may break, uh, is, is allowed to break in order to keep the structure otherwise vertically sound. But there are, these are very complicated uh, issues. I, I believe there's a lot of information available, especially from the Japanese. Um, if you noted, uh, even recently, just, just a few days ago, there was, a, there was a 6.1 earthquake in Japan and there's absolutely nothing. They, they, they don't even feel that a 6.1 is worth mentioning pretty much. Um, whereas in many other countries, a 6.1 would actually be very, very serious. So the way they design their buildings nowadays, they, they know what to do, uh, Taiwan as well. Um, I was in Taiwan, um, just before the very large, I was working there just before the very large earthquake uh, about 20 years ago, um, which leveled huge amounts of buildings. And we had just built uh, a number of buildings there using precast. And we had Japanese consultants on board. And I was happy to say that our buildings actually became the uh, relief centers 
when buildings in the whole region collapsed and these buildings did not, whether they were commercial shopping centers or residential buildings, they withstood. And I can't remember, it was seven point something. It was, it was a very large one in central Taiwan. And uh, these buildings withstood that uh, requirement very well in practice. So it, it certainly is not a situation where you can say the precast is not going to be as suitable in seismic areas. It certainly can if it's designed correctly. So earlier I mentioned these splice leaves and in one of my slides, that is that is a critical component in, in uh, Japanese and Taiwanese um, seismic design for columns. They always use splice leaf connections. Um, we, we don't use so many here in Malaysia, but, but there they always use them and they have become the, the market standard in terms of precast connections. What was the second question I... I the I second question ask? is that um, one of your slides show the precast connection using the emulative cast in place system. He asked about the disease cause uh, more still but uses as compared to the conventional system. And if, if we compare to the mechanical connection, whether it is cheaper or more expensive, the emulated cast in place. Mm. Okay. Um, when, when you talk about any of these proprietary connection systems, uh, embedded, embedded items that we, that we cast into the components for, for connections, um, as I mentioned, actually, if you look at direct cost, it, it might not look competitive. But where, where it becomes competitive is, is actually two, two sides of it. When you use these uh, proprietary systems, you don't need to actually, you, you can actually solve some of the issues related to the component size. But let me explain just a little bit. Sometime when you want to connect a column and a beam, and let's say there's even uh, beams coming to the column from four sides, and you try to fit in all the bars, you simply cannot fit them in. When it's a conventional system, there's lapping of bars. It go, it, the bar just goes through once, vertically and horizontally. So you can fit it in easier. With a precast connection, you need to have bars coming in from all four sides, if you have a full moment joint. And vertically as well, you need to have lapping. So when you do all of that, you simply can't fit it you can't fit the bars. So the typical solution is we make our components slightly bigger in order to have more space. But when you use these proprietary systems, sometimes you can solve that issue. For example, you put in two of the beams are using lapping bars and two are using a connection system. And you can maintain the component size in the original size and you don't need to change so that it's bigger. Secondly, the installation of components using these systems is much faster than a wet joint. But let me explain. If you have a wet joint connection, as, as uh, I showed in my slides here, typically um, this one on the left. So the, these, two, these two beams coming in right and left side, once they are installed here, there is a, there is a portion in between here that needs to be cast with wet concrete. Now that connection has to harden first before you can continue and install up. If you're using the proprietary system, you don't need to wait. The moment this column and beam connection is done and is fixed, you can, for example, you're using column shoes. You can just put in your column above, tighten the column shoes and you're ready to go one floor up. So a lot of times it's also in, in terms of speed that it's important. So is it more expensive? Probably a little bit, probably a little bit. So if budget is your only constraint, then maybe a wet connection is still a better choice if you can solve it. If speed is, in, is important, um, by all means, the proprietary systems are there to assist you. Okay, thank you for the answer. Now we have uh, one question from the audience, Mr. Irfan. You want to ask your question directly? You can unmute. Okay, Mr. Irfan. Yes. 
Yes, please. Halo. Mungkin ya. langsung aja bahasa Indonesia, Pak Irfan. Oh, boleh. Bahasa Indonesia nggak apa-apa ya. Silahkan. Ya. Uh, yang mau saya tanyakan uh, mungkin uh, terkait uh, pengalaman uh, Pak Nadi, uh, uh, apakah pernah mengalami atau me menemukan uh, permintaan dari klien uh, dari bangunan yang uh, tadinya emang sudah dibangun full precast, kemudian ada extension terhadap uh, bangunan tersebut, di mana extensionnya itu ter, uh, uh, bangunan tersebut nanti akan menyatu dengan bangunan precast yang uh, existing. Nah itu kira-kira uh, 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 apa peng, penanganannya bagaimana? Apakah untuk bangunan baru itu dibuatkan struktur yang terpisah sendiri atau ada special treatment terhadap existing struktur di mana kita bisa langsung mengejekkan meng, e, gitu e, ba, apa e, struktur precast yang baru terhadap bangunan yang sudah lama e, itu yang pertama terus yang kedua tadi kan saya juga melihat ada e, beam white paint yang e, di tengahnya itu ada openingan yang cukup e, di tengah-tengah gitu yang cukup e, besar dan panjang bentangan ini lumayan seperti yang kita ketahui kan biasanya di tengah itu merupakan titik defleksi yang eh, paling besar yang rawan untuk eh, terjadi cracking di sana nah itu pengen saya tanyakan apakah ada special treatment terhadap eh, kondisi tersebut sehingga eh, tidak terjadi crack di sana eh, selanjutnya Apakah dengan adanya openingan tersebut eh, itu mengubah titik angkat dari eh, end tersebut, apa eh, beam tersebut? Jadi ketika kita titik angkatnya tadinya mungkin eh, di seperempat bentang atau bagaimana, kemudian berubah menjadi eh, di, eh, berapa berapa dari bentangan karena adanya eh, openingan tersebut? Mungkin itu Pak. Oke, okay, terima kasih Pak Irfan. Um, Mr. Mati, do you understand from uh, the question Vasa or uh, Okay, I will try to translate. Yeah. Translate. So the the first question he asked if there is a uh let's say a existing building using the precast concrete is already been built and then if the client uh, wants to extend means uh, they want to build another building using the precast concrete Is there any uh, special treatment for the connections between the two buildings? I mean, whether we have to do something with the existing buildings or we just uh, build uh, new buildings and then connect with uh, some type of connections. Uh, and that is uh, the first question. And then the second question is that uh, he asked about the long span by beam, whether there is uh, openings. So for the such long span beams, which is uh, very susceptible to cracks in the mid span, is there any special treatment for the beam to uh, prevent the crack in the mid span? And then for the lifting, lifting pro, uh, purposes, is there any special treatment also for that kind of beam? That is the second question. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I'll, I'll uh, handle the first one first, and meanwhile, I'll search for uh, this one I had here. Okay. The extension uh, of a, a building, uh, whether it's originally precast or it's originally conventional, uh, does have to be designed. Um, very, very often times, it's because a building is, if the other building is very old and the, and the new building is, is uh, going to be joined to it, the movement of the building, the shrinkage and everything is, is very different because of the age. So we oftentimes recommend that uh, we would actually use an expansion joint. Um, that means using joints that, such as bearings. Uh, on the joints uh, in connecting to the old. 
Um, for example, right now we're doing a building where, where the first phase of the electronic factory is, is uh, built in precast and we're now doing an extension. And uh, what, what we have is on all of the core bells, on the, the columns have core bells. So on all of the core bells, we're actually putting in a, a expansion joint uh, bearing, a bearing, uh, what do you call it, slip, slip joint bearing. And uh, that, that is oftentimes used. Now that is of course, when, it, when it's a very large building, as in this case, now, if it's a very small building, um, oftentimes it, it has to be engineered, of course. And so we, what we need to do is if we want to really connect it well, then we need to expose the, the reinforcement in the other building, maybe by hacking some of it open and then connecting to that one when we want to make a very rigid connection. So both are possible and I think both uh, need to be determined by the engineer, which one they prefer uh, to be used in each case. The, the other question is uh, related to the long span beams. And I just wanted to pick this picture up again here for, for one of the IKEA projects where, where we have, as you can see on the bottom right-hand side here, um, openings going through the beams. Um, when you're talking about long span beam, Obviously, the, the determining uh, design factor in the center of the beam is your moment and uh, your bending. And uh, as, as you would know as engineers, um, openings in the center portion of the beam, as shown here, actually do not affect the bending capacity of the beam very much at all. Um, where these openings would be dangerous would be at closer to the end of the beam, because then that would affect your shear capacity. So as long as these openings are, are done in the center portion of the beam, and of course they have to be designed, they cannot be just randomly picked and as big as you want, but uh, put in a few openings of a reasonable size, um, they do not affect your, your uh, bending capacity as much as it, it might seem. So actually it, it is, is actually easy to do. In terms of lifting, here you can see in the same picture as well, all pre-stress components, and this is a pre-stress beam, heavily pre-stress beam. The, the bottom flange, it is an I-beam. Uh, you can say an I, it has a, is a very big top flange and a very big bottom flange with a web in between, which is narrow. And the bottom and the top flange the, are, are pre-stressed. So typically in this case, the bottom flange is, is pre-stressed for bending and the top flange might be pre-stressed to limit the camber. So sometimes if you just pre-stress the bottom, the beam will camber a lot. It's very, very heavily bent. So you also pre-stress the top in order to bring it back to, to a more straight uh, structure. Nevertheless, all pre-stressed components whether it's a long beam like this or hollow core slab or any pre-stress product, they must only be lifted from the ends. As you can see here, there's a lifting loop at the very end. And uh, similar on hollow core slabs, um, I don't remember if I had any picture of uh, hollow core slab lifting. Mm, even here, you can't see it. But similarly, the hollow core slabs also are lifted from the ends. And they also need to be stored from the ends. So it's an important thing to remember. It cannot be supported from the center because it has no bending capacity in the negative direction, in the, in the, in the vertical direction from the center. It has to be supported from the ends. So as you can see here, there's very long lifting. Uh, these, these are might be chains, I'm not sure. Very long lifting chains to the uh, lifting loops that are embedded into the beam in the, in the casting stage. So I hope that uh, again answers your question. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matthew Mikola for answering the question. I think due of the time, that will be the last question for this session. Thank you again, Mr. Matthew Mikola for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, can you share the slide uh, presentation slide with us uh, maybe you can later send to dr antony for the file okay i will i will do that okay thank you
So I return back to Dr. Anthony as a host. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Matsumikola for the nice presentation and uh, Dr. Jimmy Chandra for the moderator for this session. Uh, due to the due to the time extension, I think we will have a five minute break and then we will uh, return to the second session uh, with a presentation from uh, Dr. Pamuda Puji Suryadi. I, uh, is that okay, everyone? So, yeah, I think that should be okay. So we'll return at 2.35 uh, local time. So please uh, return and, and thank you for uh, Mr. Makti. You can stay if you like, but <laughs> if you're not, then thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Makti. Uh, you are okay. still mute. Yeah, well, welcome. Uh, my pleasure to, to be here today to attend. Uh, okay. So please take a break, everyone. <laughs> 